So welcome to Ordinary Life, which is an educational offering of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. I do that again? No. All right. You're fine. Holly Hudley is sitting here, and I'm so grateful yeah. for you. Thanks. Me too. I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for you, not grateful for me, but I'm grateful to be alive. <laughs> And when we started this, we thought it would be two or three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming closer to a year than we are to. It will be a year. Yeah. You okay to, as they say, soldier own? Hey, we're on the front lines, man. I'm excited about the fact that enrollment is increasing for Dr. Jackie Lewis who is going to be here for an all-day webinar on Saturday, October the 17th. And she will be here during um, Ordinary Lifetime on Sunday, October the 18th. Saturday is a webinar and is free, but you need to register for it. You can do that by going to the homepage of Ordinary Life. OrdinaryLife.org will take you there and get you to a lot of other things that uh, you may not know about as resources. Um, somebody asked me this week about books that we recommend during the time that we're talking. And Holly has um, curated a list of those books and put them at the top of the resources menu on the Ordinary Life uh, page. And Holly regularly writes a blog. That oh, I have not done one in some time. Holly sometimes writes a blog, <laughs> but it used to be regular. Used to, and I, I think when I, now I'm writing these every week. Maybe it's I just need to take excerpts and good stuff. make it a blog. <laughs> but. So um, I have prided myself on the fact that during the 20, 30 years I've taught here at St. Paul's, 20 plus in Ordinary Life and 10 in Mind and Spirit. I've never asked for money. Uh, these are different times. And so Holly's going to remind you. So Holly's going to ask for money. I, Holly's going to ask you for money. It gets me off the hook. So we do have an opportunity still to donate to Ordinary Life and um, appreciate everyone's generosity for sure. When we receive donations for Ordinary Life, they go, get disseminated at the end of the year to nonprofits in the Houston area and beyond that are uh, focused on empowering the poor and underserved. So it's very much appreciated. And when you go to Ordinary Life's website, you just click on any one of the donate buttons and it'll take you through how to do it. Just be sure that when you get to the form, you write Ordinary Life in the memo. That's good. There you go. And we have a podcast that airs every Thursday called In Between, In Between Holly and Me. Sometimes we have a guest mm -hmm. uh, in between um, the no longer and the not yet and in between uh, the end of gathering as we once knew it and whatever is in the future that we're still reaching for, trying to figure out the cases don't get easier. I think we should have William and Olivia on our podcast. She walked away. He said, <laughs> he's saying, I bet would you, would you do that, William? He sure. said, he said, sure. sure. He said, sure. <laughs> we can do it. Well, the message that we have for you is that no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you're welcome here. Pajama people, mimosa people, wine and cheese people, wherever you are, we're we're glad that you're here. And by the way, I did mention all. I did mean to mention also. Uh, explore the Ordinary Life website, and uh, if you want to give us some feedback about it, you may have noticed that we have changed the template that we are using uh, to do the overhead slide zone. We're welcome to feedback about that as well. Yes, we are. I thought you were going to say something different. Like what? We just want to know if you can see them well. We've changed some of the fonts to be bold. We've tried to make it a little bit more simple and clear. So, If the fonts can be bold, then we can tone down our boldness. Yeah, that's right. 
we can make them That's shout. Fun. We don't have to shout. <laughs> Somebody did ask me, why do you still have cartoons on that are about people silencing their cell phones? And in the announcement slides, and those cartoons are there as an expression of hope. I believe there will be a time when we will gather again and there will be people who come in here and embarrass themselves by not silencing their cell phones. There's always and, one. Okay, I have got something I want to do. But I just I'm, want to point out that in our podcast, your cell phone goes off almost every time we're recording. Almost every time. All right, the, the last two times <laughs> I put my landline phone uh -huh. in the drawer in the desk. Yeah. And then forgot about it. And then I f forgot where I put it. <laughs> it's an old person's thing. Old person thing. Okay. Um, I generally thank uh, John Watson and Tim Leatherwood and William Budge and Olivia Watson for being the floor people who help us out. And today I've asked Olivia if she would come up here and stand here. She doesn't have to say but one thing. Okay. Well, I hope she remembered that line. Because since I'm going to be talking a little bit about miracles, mm -hmm. I thought that um, I would show a miracle. Okay. Who is the greatest magician ever to live? Scott Wales. Scott Wales, people. Scott Wales. There you go. <laughs> Actually, um, people more my age would probably have said something like, what would you say? Scott Wells. Scott Wells. <laughs> you wouldn't even say David Copperfield. Uh, no, because I couldn't remember his name. How about Harry Houdini? Sure, yeah. But that, my dog we nicknamed Houdini because he could get out of anything too. So I might say my dog. Well, this trick is named Harry Houdini. Okay. And, and um, Houdini, you never heard of. You did hear about it. Houdini was a, an escape artist. He didn't start his career that way. He started his career as a magician. And during that time, um, he mostly used trap doors where he performed. But he was just going through a stage. Oh, 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 uh, oh, oh, oh. There would have been uproarious laughter here. I if, have a joke. What does a British owl say? A British owl? Whom? Oh, yeah, you're right. Dang it. <laughs> I guess. Right, go on with your joke. <laughs> I mean, your magic. <laughs> I made some fish tacos the other day. Did you hear that? And they just ate a little bit of the chip and then swam away. They didn't care for them. Okay. I made some fish. Tacos. Yeah. I made a chicken salad. Uh -huh. The chicken didn't need a bite didn't, of it. He didn't eat it. Yeah. So this trick is in honor of Houdini. Okay. So here, put your two fingers through there and don't pull on it too hard. Just make sure that the card has some structural integrity. And while you do that, I'm going to get up and come around and um, set this up as a um, Houdini experiment in cards. All right, all right. Now we've not worked out anything ahead of time. There's nothing. There's nothing planned here. Is that correct? No. Should we put our fingers down? No. I want you to leave yours like that. Okay. And uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, um, Olivia, is I'm going to ask you. I'm going to put these cards on her fingers. I'm going to ask you to reach through and hold her fingers. Hold one in each hand, so that the card can't get off. So it's on there. It's on there, right? Mm-hmm. Watch. Oops, I dropped it. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait. But it came off, and the cards are structurally intact. Yes. So you can have that for a souvenir. Okay. You can have that for a souvenir. Now, here's the deal. Uh-huh. If you take your card home and put it under your pillow at night, during the night, it will turn into a $100 bill. Okay. Okay. And right before you wake up, it will turn back into a car. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Oh, goodness. All right, Bill. <laughs> All right, what? It's a miracle. <laughs> it was a miracle. The card stayed intact, even though... It came off your finger. It came off my finger. How'd that happen? Uh, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> I did that because we're going to talk about miracles today, mm -hmm. somewhat. 
at many different levels how miracles got introduced into the Jesus story and the miracle that is behind the beatitude that we are seeking to talk about today. I think one of the truly unique stories from the Hebrew tradition involves a series of encounters between God and Moses. Moses had numerous encounters with God. Now, I suppose most people know something about Moses Charlton Heston, <laughs> Charlton Heston Moses. Moses was in the second generation of Israelites who were born into slavery in Egypt. Pharaoh, <clears throat> you might remember, had all ordered the killing of all the babies and um, Moses' mother hid the baby Moses in the bulrushes by the Nile River and Pharaoh's daughter went down to the river to bathe and Moses' older sister was keeping an eye on the basket in the bulrushes to see what would happen to her brother. And uh, when she sees Pharaoh's daughter has found the baby, she goes to Pharaoh's daughter and offers to find a mother for the baby. And Pharaoh's daughter says, sure. So Miriam goes and gets Moses' real mother, whose name is Jochebed, and uh, so brings her to Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter gets Moses' mother to raise Moses as her own son, which, of course, he is. Pharaoh names the baby Moshe, which is a very common Jewish name. Moshe means drawn out from the water. So Moses lives in the Egyptian court. He's aware he's a Hebrew. And one day he goes out to see the slaves at work and he observes a slave master beating a, a Hebrew slave to death. And Moses in retaliation, beats that slave master to death. And then he decides that it would probably be best for him not to hang around there much longer. So he heads off for the wilderness and lives as a shepherd among the people in the Sinai Peninsula. One day Moses on Mount Horeb has his first encounter with God. When he sees a bush that is burning without being consumed by the fire, he hears the voice of God coming from the bush, instructing him to return to Egypt and to free his fellow Israelites from slavery. And the voice says, Moses, come near, but take off your shoes because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Most theologians see this as a firm affirmation of incarnation because God is in dirt, God is in stuff, and that notion of incarnation will go all the way through the Jewish Christian narrative uh, until now. One of my very favorite quotes is based on the story of the burning bush. It comes from Browning who wrote, all the world's a bush aflame with God. Those who see take off their shoes those who don't sit around and pick blackberries. I love that. <laughs> I just love that because it, it says that the sacred is everywhere and the task is in seeing it. And again, this will feed into the beatitude we're going to talk about today. From this time on in the Hebrew story, it becomes clear that the emphasis in the entire Bible Jewish and then in the teachings of Jesus will focus on political oppression and the poverty that results from that oppression. Now, this is something that most of us have not been taught. It's too much in conflict with the religion of our culture, consumerism. But the theology of the Jews would focus on what theologians call the option for the poor. And this would be the emphasis of the Hebrew prophets and, and of Jesus. One person, Nicholas Beridav, said, 
If I'm hungry, that's a material problem. If someone else is hungry, that is a spiritual problem. At any rate, Moses encountered his brother, whose name is Aaron, on the road back to Egypt. And they are instructed by God. There's another God encounter. They are instructed by God what they will need to do to convince the Israelites that they should be led out of Egypt and then what they can do to convince Pharaoh that Pharaoh should let the uh, Hebrews go. And God equips Aaron and Moses with a wonderful set of magic tricks or miracles that they can do to convince Pharaoh. Pharaoh has his own magicians who can counter with their own magic. And if you want to read this story in its full in the book of Exodus, it, it's really quite nice. Pharaoh agrees, he relents, he agrees, he relents, he agrees, he relents. There's a series of horrible plagues in which Pharaoh finally, his spirit is broken. He agrees to let the Israelites go. So they get out of Egypt and on the way, Pharaoh relents once again and sends his army after them. And that's where you have the great scene where the Red Sea parts, the children of Israel go through as the Egyptian soldiers are right in the middle of the sea, God causes the water to drown them all. Wonderful, wonderful story about the love of God in that story. It's also when they wrote the song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, you <laughs> let my people go, right? Yeah. Yeah. God doesn't come across as very loving in these stories. No. Well, it's indicative of a worldview, isn't it? One day... Moses goes up on Mount Horeb, spends 40 days up there talking to God, listening to God. And Moses descends from the mountain and he has some stone tablets in his hand on which are written the Ten Commandments. But when he comes down, he finds that during the 40 day period that he's been up there, the Israelites have gotten discouraged. So they want something to do. So they build a, a God out of gold, a bull. An, a f false idol and they're worshiping it and having an orgy and Moses comes down and he sees that he gets really ticked off and he takes the Ten Commandments and throws them on the ground and breaks them and we'll never know what they said. We have a piece of it in our yard. It's a really giant rock. Is this having it written on it? Yeah, but you can't read it if you oh. don't know the original Aramaic. Moses becomes known then as the lawgiver. And he comes up with all manner of laws that uphold justice, as well as ritual purity, which became a big thing in, um, among the Israelites. And at one point, God becomes so frustrated with the Israelites that he tells them they're all going to die in the wilderness, waiting around 40 years. They're not going to get into the Holy Land at all. Only your children will get to go to Canaan. And one of the hardships that the Israelites suffered during this time was death from snake bite. So Moses fashions a brass snake that he can hold up on a stick. And if anybody looks on it and has faith, they will be healed. This is one, not the only, but it's one of the sources of the um, caduceus symbol on the doctor's staff, mm -hmm. the snake on the doctor's staff. There's other one that comes from a Greek god mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. who used snakes in healing. Now, we, we could spend hours and hours talking about Moses' story, the implication of Moses' story for the Jesus story. Uh, one implication is that all of the miracle stories that we have in the Christian collection about Jesus <clears throat> come from Moses, Aaron, Elisha, and Elijah. Moses, Joshua, Elisha, and Elijah. Two of the neatest miracles in the, the Moses story, in addition to the parting of the Red Sea, um, were these. I'll tell you two, and then I'll let these go. First, the Israelites had several violent encounters with people around them. And they were in a battle against the Amalekites. Although I never felt that people drove all the way across town just to hear the latest thing that happened with the Amalekites. But Moses, 
wields a great power in this battle by holding his arms up. As long as he's holding his arms up, the children of Israel are winning, but when he fatigues and he gets tired, the arms go down, the children of Israel start losing. So Ben and Aaron hold his arms up, and when they hold his arms up, they start winning again. Mm -hmm. This is the first use of when a wave actually helped a team to win. <laughs> That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from, the story of Moses, right there. It's a, it's, it's a great story. And the, the other miracle that happens uh, happens to Joshua because when Moses dies, Joshua is going to be his successor and Joshua needs to have the same miraculous power that Jesus, that Moses had. So um, Joshua one day commanded the sun to stand still in the sky. This one enables Joshua's army more daylight time in which his soldiers were able to kill more retreating Amorites before the Israelites found safety under the cover of darkness. It's just the kind of thing that God would buy into. Now, Jesus was intended, especially by Matthew, to be the new Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain to talk to God and gets the Ten Commandments. Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and sees Moses along with others. Jesus also gives the teachings that we have from the Sermon on the Mount, more a, a different set of commandments, as it were. Now, I'm going into all this material today about Moses and Aaron and Joshua to get to one story. Hmm. At one point, discouraged, knowing he would not be permitted to go to the promised land because he took credit for something God should have had credit for. Um, Moses asked God, please, let me see your face. And God says, you may not see my face. No one can see me and live. But look, here is a place right beside me. Put yourself in this rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I'll take my hand away and you will see my back but you won't see my face. By the way, this happened right before Moses went back up on the mountain to get another set of the Ten Commandments. I don't know what literalists do with these stories. <laughs> I just don't know. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to tell the story about God hiding Moses in the cleft of the rock and covering Moses with his hand uh, and then allowing God, uh, Moses to see God's backside. The um, King James Version of this says, God says to Moses, I will let you see my hind parts. <laughs> At least two hymns in the Christian tradition are based on the story, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, let, my hide, let Me Hide Myself in Thee. And then there was one written by Fanny Crosby, which we don't sing. It's not in the Methodist hymnal anymore, but it was in the hymnal of the church where I grew up, and we sang it regularly. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. I got one other picture of Moses. We saw this in Rome. This is in a church in Rome. And it was done by some small artist. He's not very well known. Not very well known. Yeah. Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. You notice Moses, Moses has horns. Mm -hmm. And that's because in the, if memory serves, in the 32nd chapter of Exodus, in the Vulgate, after Moses comes down from the second time of getting the second set of Ten Commandments, the Vulgate, a very difficult translation, uh, wants to say his face shined, but the way that it got translated was his face horned, hmm. 
and Michelangelo took it literally. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty neat. Yeah. He has this um, almost like Greek characteristic. There's so much similarity between the Greek myths and the Old Testament. Just that there's the mythology in the two are two traditions are really really closely linked. So here's the point. We all long in one way or another to see God, to see the sacred. And God tells Moses, nope, not on my watch, but I'll let you see my hind parts. And then comes along Jesus in this beatitude that we're looking at today, where Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Or the way Gene Patterson, Eugene Patterson translates it, you're blessed when you get your inside world, that is your mind and heart put right, then you can see God in the outside world. More than the hind parts too, maybe. More than the hind parts, but certainly there. You know, when I was little, for some reason, we thought it was the funniest thing in the world to moon cars as they pass by. There's probably a lot of people in West U who have seen my hind parts. You did that? Yep. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but we did. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, so <laughs> on to Jesus. <laughs> There's three things that Jesus does in almost all of his teachings. He makes these moves to challenge conventional wisdom. He offers a diagnosis of the human condition, which is the falsehood of separation. And he offers us a way of transformation, not to be confused with change. So change is something new, like wearing new glasses, right? But transformation is the falling away of something old, which so often happens after a kind of crisis of the imagination. We are, I think, right now, for all intents and purposes, in the midst of a crisis of imagination. A lot of us are asking, who are we right now? What do we want to be about? Where are we going? We need more than just a change right now, and we certainly can't go back to business as usual. So what is transformation and how do we do it? I'm going to use one of the most classic stories of transformation that nature offers us which is that of a caterpillar to the butterfly. When the caterpillar weaves its cocoon, it kind of nestles in there and it completely loses its caterpillar shape. In other words, there's nothing of the caterpillar left in the cocoon. If you were to open it in the midst of this cocooning period, all that you would get would be ooze. It would just ooze out. But inside that ooze, for the couple of weeks that it's cocooning, are these highly organized cells called imaginal disks. Hear that word again, I love it, imaginal disks. To me, that ignites this idea that imagination is a key ingredient to transformation. Each disk becomes a particular part of the butterfly body. It becomes the eyes, wings, legs, all the markings on the butterfly, they're all contained in these imaginal disks, but during the cocooning, the work of transformation has to happen. Some caterpillars even have these tiny rudimentary wings tucked inside of their caterpillar body to remind them that someday they might fly. This is the same with the whole universe, which was contained inside of a subatomic particle known as the Big Bang. What I want you to hear here is that you too were contained inside of this particle. All of your insides, all of your parts emerged from that primordial fireball. As a metaphor, this kind of transformation is still available to all of us. So what are the shape, the shapes of your imaginal disks? When we get right with our inside world, our imaginations come alive. We can imagine more of who we want to be, how we want the world to be, and we start to realize that every label we've ever lived by that's been given to us or imposed upon us that we've taken on ourselves, though these are useful in how we sort of walk in the world, or how we get jobs, or how we introduce ourselves to people, they don't define us. We are, as William James writes, the something more we have been looking for. 
Myth and metaphor, as Bill just um, shared with us the sort of history of the myth here, connects us to something larger for sure. Otherwise, if we don't have myth and metaphor, we stay kind of stuck in a pathological selfhood. The Bible, albeit it's written with historical and social context and applies to that historical context, it's largely a set of myths and metaphors we can live by. They help us go inward while simultaneously challenging us to situate ourselves differently in the context in which we live today. So to be pure in heart is to know thyself, as Socrates said. As we get a clearer picture of ourselves, we get a clearer picture of reality the interior and the exterior start to mirror one another. And inevitably, we kind of soften. We become like that ooze. In her well-known poem, Wild Geese, Mary Oliver writes, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. So I think the questions are, who do you love and how do you love them? The answers to these questions that we come up with, they help reshape our world. I think that for most of us, myself included, mm. transformation is a better sounding idea mm. than it is an experience reality. Sure. I have a cartoon. I wish I had been mindful enough to get it and put it in our slideshow that shows a caterpillar crawling along, looking up at a butterfly flying. How does he do that? <laughs> and no, the caterpillar is saying, you'll never get me up in one of those things. Right. You know, transformation is so often the only times that I can sort of look back and say, oh, that was a period of transformation was also followed by immense suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Becoming ooze. <laughs> so that's a wonderful segue into what I want to say now. And um, that is that we have the choice of making transformational moves in one, by going through one of two doors. One is the door of immense suffering, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, death, of a loved one, loss of prized property, for example. I've said that if you get people to write down a list of all the important, your most important lessons that you've learned in life, and then to write down in what context did you learn those lessons, mm -hmm. it would be in the context of some great difficulty. So that's one way. Guess what the other is? Great joys. You have to have. Oh, like, I think I know. A daily spiritual practice? You have to have a okay. daily spiritual practice. I passed the test. <laughs> we do them so that the mood and the um, values of our culture don't capture us. And that's one of the reasons that I'm very cautious about watching things on TV. Uh, I notice, I've noticed the last several months that when I'm in my car and I turn on the radio, well over 50% of the time when the radio comes on, it's on to a commercial. Mm. Start paying attention to that. I listen to NPR mostly. They have fewer commercials. They have fewer commercials. Yeah. That's true. So I've got, <clears throat> got to quit listening to the comedy channel. <laughs> blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your heart and your mind put right. And then you can begin to see God in the outside world. So the student who has been studying with this master for years goes to the master and says, is there anything that I can do to speed up my progress toward enlightenment. And the master says, no, no more than there's something that you can do to make the sun come up earlier in the morning. And the student protests by saying, then why do you make me do all these arduous spiritual practices? 
And the master replied, so your eyes will be open when the sun comes up in the morning. This saying of Jesus is the one of the Beatitudes which seems to have the biggest payoff to this, see God. But it is also the one that seems the least attainable. You pure in heart. Hmm. You got your stuff together? Me neither. Fortunately for us, the, the phrase pure in heart doesn't mean being morally pure. Uh, although what it means will create more morally, ethically behaved people. I mentioned several times in going through these Beatitudes that they are like a ladder that we climb one rung at a time. One of the meanings of this pure in heart is that the pure in heart are those who know about the preceding Beatitudes. They know about poverty. They know about grieving. They know about getting their identity from the sacred. They know about being committed to justice. When our hearts are right about these things, then our seeing begins to be corrected. If our hearts are not right about these things, then our seeing is distorted. If there's someone we don't like, someone we want to hurt, someone we want to make feel bad, and it doesn't matter whether that person is your best friend, your, your life partner, somebody who lives in Afghanistan, if there is a coldness and a lack of forgiveness in us or the desire to do violence to them, either verbally or physically, we're not going to be able to see what is. So developing the capacity to see what is and developing the capacity to be with what is in a non-judgmental manner is the heart of spiritual practice. That is so important. I'm going to say it again. Hmm. to develop the capacity to see what is and to develop the capacity to be with what is in a non-judgmental manner is the heart of, pure, of, of spiritual practice. Having a pure heart means working to see as God sees. I, I don't know many people like this. I know a few and one of the reasons I like to be around them is not what I think about them or how I feel about them, but when I'm around them, it's how I think about me. It's how I feel about me when I'm in the presence of someone, say, like Jim, Jim Finley. Um, I've, I've done personal counseling now for decades and still do. And um, it's one of the things in my life I have been most privilege to do, to share stories with people at, at times in the midst of some of their most profound struggles. And more times than I can count, I have heard somebody say in one form or another that they don't like themselves or to say, you know, if you truly knew me, you would not like me. And when I hear talk like that, what I know is that there's not so much psychological work to be done as there is spiritual work to be done. They've not been taught and do not know that there is a divine image within them. They don't see themselves as God does. Now, Jesus taught that we live in the sacred heart of God. He called it living in the kingdom of God. Actually, what I have become convinced of is that Jesus called it living and loving in the empowered community and being empowered by that community. Whatever you call it, I doubt that many of us truly believe that that is where we live. I doubt many of us really trust that that is true. Most of the time, we have work to do. Yet, the teaching is that the pure in, in heart see this. They see God. Or those who get their insides right see this 
on the outside. Now it's true the other way around too. Developing the ability to see God in everything and everyone changes everything. Mm -hmm. in, in Jesus' time, what mattered was the community you were a part of, the community that you belong to, the community that you got your identity from. He belonged to a community. And the people in that community mattered to him so much that he could say, as you have done it to one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. Mm. Yeah, there's we have a lot of work to do in that in that way, I think. There's a man um, named Father Gregory Boyle. He was here actually about four years ago. Um, he gave a talk at St. Paul's, but he's a Jesuit priest in Southern California who started an organization called Homeboy Industries. I highly encourage you to look it up and read his book, Tattoos on the Heart. It is funny. It is heartbreaking. It is um, full of wonderful, colorful language and just his interactions with the work that he's done over the years in working with mostly gang members in Southern, in around the LA area. He thought at first when he started Homeboy Industries that he would save these gang members. But the deeper he got into it, the more he realized three things. Number one, he couldn't save them. Number two, he could only mirror back to them glimpses of their true selves. So when he saw them come alive in some way, he would say, there you are. Mm. Yeah. Um, and number three, he was no more in service to these young men and women than they were to him. He echoes so many wisdom teachers in saying, the Lord comes to us disguised as ourselves. Of course, we get introduced to ourselves time and again, and in many circumstances, we're given this opportunity to ask, who do we want to be? Who am I in this circumstance? And hopefully, over time, we open up to ourselves with arms of compassion. This process of knowing just who we are, of getting right with our hearts and minds, is the slow work of God. It is, like evolution, a long, lifelong process, I would say. Recognizing, Gregory Boyle says that recognizing that we are wholly acceptable is God's own truth for us, waiting to be discovered. Being handed back to ourselves is the only praise God has any time for. He looks a lot like Richard Rohr. Yeah, he does. Is there a thing with like Catholic monks? <laughs> Do they all, oh, you know, he looks a little like you too, Bill, this gray beard and balding head. Huh, maybe this is the path of wisdom teachers. Could be. Could be. But he tells, he tells so many wonderful stories. And w one that I um, captured as I was kind of rereading some of his work was the story of a young man who at age six, so we have to kind of frame this. So many of the young men, mostly young men he works with, are they don't just turn out to be gang members because they made a choice in life, but their whole life is, is, is pointing them towards seeking greater belonging. And sometimes in the neighborhoods that they grew up in, the way that they could belong was by becoming part of a gang. And they come often from broken homes, uh, uh, parentless homes, fatherless homes. They come from generations of poverty. And so they're seeking a way to belong. And what Gregory Boyle has done is created a community in which they belong. But he tells this story of a young man whose mother told him at age six, at six, it would be so much better if you just died. Wow. Then when he was nine, she left him at an orphanage for 90 days until his grandmother found out where he was and got him back. Mm. His mother beat him every day so much that he wore three t-shirts to school to hide the bleeding and the bruises. He used to hate his wounds. He was ashamed of them. And he wore three shirts well into his adulthood out of that shame. But at some point, he's now a mentor in this program he became a drug addict, he became clean. He realized that in becoming sort of in recovery, that he needed to love his wounds, to make friends with them. For without those wounds, he could not tend to the wounded. Going inward 
I think, is part of learning to love our wounds. God inside and God outside are both waiting to be discovered and also healed. I think when we can get to that, how our interior world mirrors how we do our exterior world, we begin to live by the words etched in Thomas, which thank you for spending a year on that because I still love this verse. If you bring forth what is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, it will destroy you. The most fundamental exchange of that kind of interior and exterior worlds is in our breath. It's no accident that so many meditation techniques are based on breathing. As it gets fuller and deeper, we can feel ourselves soften, as Mary Oliver wrote, opening and getting more spacious inside. The breath takes us into our very core. In fact, one aspect of God, one that we don't talk that much about, is the Holy Spirit, right? So let's look at the etymology of spirit. Spirare is br to breathe. It became spiritus, which is breath or spirit, and then we adopted it into spirit. So God then becomes the holy breath. Breath is this intuitive metaphor for a primordial being. There is no life without breath. The Judeo-Christian scriptures say right from the beginning that it was breath or the spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters that brought everything into being. All living beings, human, plant, animal, are linked by an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the inhale and the exhale of this living planet. In fact, our lives are enclosed by two breaths, the first breath we take when we are born and the last breath we take when we die. With every breath, we take in also these ancient and current molecules of the world. I love the idea that, and I think, um, ha, I can't, now I'm blanking on his name, but I love that this idea that when we take in a breath, we're breathing in the Big Bang, we're breathing in atoms of the dinosaurs, of Moses, of Jesus, of Beethoven, of Einstein, of whoever our ancestors were, they become part of us. And however nominally, each breath transforms us. So we're indeed exchanging life with everything that ever was and everything that ever will be. When we exhale, something our, ourselves then mingles with everything else. This inward, outward dance is made possible in every moment. So we don't even really have to think about it. It is always happening. But when we become attentive to it, we're getting right with our hearts and minds. This is the exact purpose of spiritual practice, to turn inward to better see the sacred outside, and then to turn outward to better see the sacred inside. We cannot connect to the outside world without paying attention to the specific embodiment that we have within it. So we begin by focusing on the breath. The other, yeah. I wanted to say that um, if you go on to YouTube and look up Jim Finley, mm -hmm. I think you can find a meditation that he does on using the breath as a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. In essence, what he says is that he teaches this practice where when we breathe in, we say, I love you, which mm -hmm. is the voice of God. And when we breathe out, we say, and I love you. I love you. I love you. Mm, that's beautiful. And Pima Chodron, in one of her books, has this specific teaching on a Buddhist practice that's called Tonglen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Tonglen, you breathe in mm -hmm. the negativity of the world, willing to take it into yourself. Mm -hmm. You become a Shambhala warrior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Transform that mm -hmm. and send out one of the loving kindness things, one of the four immeasurables of love that we've talked about from Buddhism, although they're common to any living tradition, of love and joy and compassion and equanimity. Yeah. It's a great practice. It is. And we can, I mean, we literally have that opportunity every breath. moment. Every breath. Every, every to, breath. To, to have our interior and exterior align, right? So the other day I saw this sticker when Josh and I were on a walk. <laughs> Jesus breathes life into us. 
I don't know the purpose behind this sticker or who put it on, but normally this kind of speech kind of makes a little squirmy because I associate it with a sort of evangelical mindset view uh, or bent on converting everyone. But when I read it metaphorically, that is exactly what this beatitude is giving us, breath an opportunity again to focus on what we put into our hearts and minds, how we transform it, and therefore what we put back into the world. James Baldwin, who I love, social critic and brilliant writer, said on the whole, white people in this country will have quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves and each other. And when they have achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and may very well be never, the Negro problem will no longer exist, for it will not be needed. This is our work to do, to get right with our hearts and minds so that we do not have need of an other. The important work of going inward directly affects our social relationships, our racial relationships in the outside world. In fact, a central tenet of Buddhism, as we were just talking about, is that we can only begin to change the world by first looking at how we see the world. We can only love or hate another person as much as we love or hate ourselves. And in learning to love ourselves, we participate in world repair, tikkun olam. That is probably my favorite concept of mystical Judaism is the idea of everything that we do restores the light in the world. I read something in the Sojourner's publication just this week where a woman said that she made it part of her spiritual practice to watch the film by James Baldwin, I Am Not Your Negro, at least twice a year. Mm. It's a good film. Yeah. He's, he, he, he's he, so brilliant. He was so brilliant. <laughs> yeah. He's, and so relevant still. I mean, I, I highly encourage y'all to pick up some James Baldwin and start reading it. But in learning to love ourselves, we do, as we participate in Tikkun Olam, we realize that there's no other there's no such thing as supremacy or hierarchy when we get right with our inside world because we can't help but see ourselves in everything and everything in ourselves. I really, really believe, and this is optimistic of me maybe, that the further we go inward, the bigger the world gets. I don't think either the world or us gets smaller in that practice. We become more expansive, less constricted, it's like when you realize, oh, I haven't taken a deep breath in some time, and you feel your body closing in on itself, but when you remember to breathe, something expands. In this space, we cannot unsee things like injustice, inequity, racism, or sexism. It can be uncomfortable because immediately we want to fix it. We don't know what to do or how to approach these problems, but that discomfort is also worth breathing into. Every time we go inward, we grow outward. We never truly leave ourselves, though we try mightily through addiction, through denial and violence, but we are the ones we have to face at the end of every day. I liked this question that Charles M. Blow, journalist at the New York Times, posed at the end of a lecture he gave through the Rothko Chapel online the other night. What privileges are you willing to give up so that the justice and, mercy, justice and mercy you profess to believe in becomes a reality. What are you willing to give up? Power, wealth, and prestige, these are all just artificial notions of a self. The true power is in the Beatitudes that precede this one, humility, justice, mercy. Living by these are getting right with our inside world. And in so doing, not only do we get to know ourself, but we get to know God. And suddenly these two become one. Any notions of God and self are only as big as we allow them to be. So the way we participate in reality draws forth that reality. What is the reality you want to draw forth? Start with breath. In it, every moment is new. In fact, our superpower as human beings is the ability to consciously change and adapt more easily than any other species. We can go from a cold climate to a hot climate within a day and adapt just fine. Uh, a lizard couldn't do that. A lizard can't go from cold, can't survive in cold. They need a warm, hot climate. 
So when we look inside, I think there's this question of, do we want to see a kind of photograph of who we want to be? Which made me think of this painting by Magritte. This is not a pipe. <laughs> you look at it and you go, yeah, it's a pipe. But it's not a pipe. It's just a painting of a pipe. And no matter what, the, the painting of the pipe will never be a pipe. So I don't know if we would want to look at our life as if we're looking at a painting, standing on the outside of it. I think, for me, the operative choice is to live it and participation in life, like to really feel ourselves alive and connected to all things, renders us completely vulnerable. We become like the ooze in the cocoon with our imaginal cells guiding the process. So I think here's the question. What do you see when you get right with your insides? You see a pipe. You see a pipe. <laughs> well, I was I was to tell the story. You know, Dominique de Manil, oh, Dominique de Manil yeah. was a major patron of Magritte, mm -hmm. and the original of this painting is here in Houston. So I've been in the in the in the sort of bowels of the Manil, and they they own so many Magritte's that they aren't all hung. And there's a, there, there's a process of restoration. So many of the Magritte's were, were attained um, after World War II. They have bullet holes in them. They have rips. So there are people sitting at their easels, literally working on these Magritte's and patching them. It's pretty magical. So I, I, I have two stories about my own, uh, a spiritual experience with this painting and another one of Magritte that I have a copy of hanging in my office mm -hmm. here at the church, uh, which Dominique had the, or has the, well, she doesn't have anything anymore, but. The Manil collection the has Manil, it. The Manil <laughs> collection has it. It's called the Empire of Light, and you've seen it. And I love it because it is, speaking of this very thing that you're trying to describe, this thing of transformation, because at the top, it's a summer daylight scene, and at the bottom, it is a rainy nighttime scene, and the shift from top to bottom is so subtle mm -hmm. that you, you, a lot of people look at it and say, what's that a photograph of? Yeah. But it's not a photograph, it's a, it's a painting. And I stood in front of this thing dozens of times, Yeah. <laughs> and then one day it just, oh. Oh, you're right. It's I not got a it. pipe. <laughs> it's a I painting of it. a pipe. Well, that, that's so that's so beautiful about how transformation works too, because it's not always like a flashbang, boom, you got it. It's subtle. It moves from day to night and night to day. And some one day we wake up and we go, oh, I feel different. <laughs> I don't quite know what it is, but we're not pointing at the pipe anymore and thinking that it's us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if we, the Manila Collection is an outstanding place to go experience the sort of magical world of, of, of Magritte. But I wonder if when we go inside, if we can't imagine seeing the face of God, not the backside of God, but the face of God in there and everywhere we look. Last night or recently, we, we've been watching this wonderful show on Apple TV called Ted Lasso. Did you watch it? Okay, it's so funny, in which the same named lead character quotes Walt Whitman as saying, be curious, not judgmental. I believe that quote is somehow derived from this poem by Walt Whitman. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least, nor do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the 24 and each moment then. In the faces of men and women I see God and in my own face in the glass. I find letters from God dropped in the street and everyone is signed by God's name. And I leave them where they are. For I know that wheresoever I go, others will punctually come forever and ever. So what Whitman is saying here is be not curious about God, but in how God shows up in you. In the faces of men and women, I see God and in my own face in the glass. With every in-breath and every out-breath, 
God inside intersects with God outside. These two are never separate. I am done. Good stuff. <laughs> well, both Holly and I hope that the time that you have chosen to invest to, in this today with us is amply rewarded. I hope you got a glimpse of the sacred today, even if it's just a hind part. And that you leave this uh, time with some ideas and tools that will lead you to live your life with a lighter heart, with eyes to see all your brothers and sisters as your brothers and sisters. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So go brighten the places where you live out your life. What I know is that walking this path, which I've dubbed ordinary life, is full of surprises and opportunities for transformation. I want to return to the Moses story just for a moment. I'll cover, my, cover you with my hand so you can't see my face, and then I'll walk by. I'll remove my hand, and you can see my backside, my hind parts. Most of us, and maybe this is just a projection of my own spirituality, probably haven't really developed the stamina to see God's butt. <laughs> that is, we don't really want a glimpse at the seamy side of life, much less look for God's glory there. We want our experiences, the sacred, to constellate around the magnificence of Gothic structure for me, the wondrousness of Christmas, the magnificence of Easter, and not in the faces of the homeless people that we can encounter when we walk out of this building where we're um, live streaming this today. And I admit there are some parts of God that seem further back than others, but there's no place devoid of God's holy presence. Jesus' teachings were intended to lead to a community of and for the common good because in the culture in which he lived, that was what was needed. And we can look back now and see that if we don't change some things in our own culture, we're on a track towards self-destruction and emptiness. We uh, live in a culture right now that is marked by a number of life-defying features. Two of these are distrust and disease, and they are inextricably linked. It has been the distrust of science that has led to the spread of the coronavirus that allows the United States to lead all the countries in the world in cases and deaths. Why is it so difficult for us to experience liberation from these false premises. Jesus' teachings were given at one and the same time to those on the top and those on the bottom. To those on the top, he kept saying, come on down, give up your power, your righteousness, and your explanations. And to those on the bottom who thought that they were nobodies, he was always saying, come on up. You're accepted with an acceptance that you don't have to buy, you don't have to earn, it's freely given. There's a gospel to oppressors and there's a gospel to the oppressed, both reversing their own self-evaluations. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Being pure in heart is about knowing that who we are is who we are in God. Now, folks, this is not a teaching for sissies. <laughs> it demands much from us. Mostly, it demands that we come out of hiding about our true selves. It requires that we make that heroic journey that Holly talked about, going inward so that we live in a bigger world. If we don't make these journeys, we risk creating religions and political systems that are nothing more than the extensions of our own prejudices. What has created the mess we're in today is fear. And we're doing the work to purify our hearts if we put down the fears that burden us so. If it's not fear for you, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's competition. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's prejudice. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's the need to control. I don't know what burden you carry. There were two Buddhists who were walking 
back to the monastery from the village. It was a long walk. They'd been there to shop. They came to a river, and at the, at the river, there was a woman standing who needed to cross over to the other side, but she couldn't. She was afraid to. And so the senior monk picked her up and carried her to the other side and put her down, and the two monks continued their walk. Miles go by, and after hours of mental torture, the student turns to the master and says, I can't stand this anymore. Back there at the river, you picked up that woman, and you know we are forbidden to touch women. And the, student looked, uh, the master looked at his student and paused for a moment and said, yes, I picked her up, and yes, I carried her across, and yes, I put her down. But you, on the other hand, are still carrying her. Mm. What burdens are you carrying in your heart that corrupts its purity, that keeps you from getting your insides right? Whatever they are, put it down. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and we will see you here next week. <laughs>